Hello and welcome to this presentation brought to you by the Mapping and Benchmarking Annex of the IEA 4E Implementing Agreement. This presentation will last around 30 minutes and brings you a summary of the results of the benchmarking report which was published regarding refrigerated vending machines in December 2012. We will begin with a definition of what we mean by the products uh, to be included in the scope of the um, analysis. Uh, then we'll discuss what data was made available for the, from the participating countries and the quality of that. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about the test methodologies in place to uh, measure the energy consumption of these products. We'll then summarize the policies that are in place uh, that aim to improve the energy efficiency of these products amongst, amongst the participating countries. We'll then look at the types of product that are in the markets uh, and that were represented in the data sets. Then we'll look at the energy performance and we'll close with a summary of some of the issues uh, and observations regarding the data um, that are pertinent for policymakers uh, in this area. So firstly, what do we mean by the refrigerated vending machines and, and which types of machine are included within the scope of this analysis. Well we've taken a definition which is largely based on that included in the Energy Star program definition and it's a self-contained refrigerated system uh, designed to accept payment and dispensed pre-packed beverages or snacks. There's a indicative temperature range of 3 degrees to 12 degrees centigrade um, for the um, dispensing and a key factor is that it involves dispensing without on-site labour intervention. So that's the basic definition of the vending machine that we've taken up. We aiming we aim to include uh, two main types of vending machine that is uh, firstly, the dedicated beverage vending, vending machines, which are designed to dispense cans or bottles of soft drinks. And secondly, the more flexible vending machines that can take food, snacks, or indeed can also dispense cans and bottles, but uh, they do have this flexible capability, de delivering uh, goods through uh, different means, but all having that ability to dispense different types of product. We have deliberately excluded from the analysis any vending machines that dispense at ambient temperatures or that have frozen uh, content. We did not analyse any uh, dispensers of hot beverages or hot food and indeed none of that mixed different types of vending, uh, of uh, temperature uh, vending. On this slide you can see some pictures of the types of product that were included. On the left hand side the dedicated beverage vending machines are designed only to dispense drinks. These are generally of the opaque fronted type uh, as you'll see on the far left but there are some dedicated machines that will also dispense, uh, that also have a glass front. And the, on the right hand side uh, there are a couple of uh, images of the type of flexible vending machines um, that are generally um, having a glass front for dispensing a variety of different types of product. The data that was used in this analysis was made available by government representatives of Australia, of the USA, which includes both Energy Star and a Californian state database from Canada and we also got uh, data from individual manufacturers for the EU. The total number of products in this data set was around 250 including uh, variants of uh, some of those models and these were from 16 different brands. Now the numbers of models and brands are, are not particularly high compared to the thousands or tens of thousands even that um, we've analysed with other product groups uh, under this uh, overall annex. But this should be considered in the context of the number of models on the global market is it may not be many more than 300 or so excluding the variants. Um, and indeed uh, there may only be 
around 20 manufacturers of these products outside of China. Um, so the representation really wasn't too bad uh, of, of this market. Um, and it covers the period from 2007 up to 2010. Um, the analysis was carried out mostly in 2011. Um, so data was up till 2010. The EU data set is small uh, compared to the data sets from the other countries and we'll show you a little bit more detail of that in a moment. Um, so that must be borne in mind. Um, also uh, a, a fact that we will come back to and explain in more detail um, but we should point out that the EU data set and the market in the EU is also different to the markets that we're comparing it with and uh, the detail of that and the effects of that we will discuss later. We basically considered that the data sets we had were reasonably representative of the markets uh, in those countries, um, bearing in mind the shortcomings that we will discuss. So if you look at the count of products in each data set for each year, that's shown in this graph um, with the uh, vertical axis on the left going up to um, 100 products um, for any given year for any given data set. And um, it's fairly clear that the USA Energy Star data set has the highest count um, up to over 90 products uh, in 2010. The EU data set um, is the lowest in the last year or so of the analysis and between the data sets there is quite a high variability of the number of products by year and um, by data sets. Um, in order to um, improve the robustness of the analysis to a certain extent or to avoid any um, undue uh, conclusions um, we did uh, exclude from the analysis the data sets uh, for any year that had less than or equal to 15 products in the set. Uh, we didn't feel that the average that would be achieved from that would be um, representative. Now if we look at the number of brands that were included in the data sets, um, these two from um, Energy Star and for Canada um, actually show uh, a reasonable number of brands in the later years. Um, USA by 2010 we had uh, five different brands included in the data set um, and Canada you can see also uh, there were six brands. Um, but this graph does show um, one of the effects that we do have to watch for in, in terms of looking at trends or indeed any step changes in the um, average performance levels in some of the later graphs. Where there's a transition in the number of brands included in the data set, this could of course introduce a step change in the average and so this must be borne in mind. Uh, so for the USA uh, between 2007 and 2008 there was a, a two additional brands uh, introduced um, and between 2008 and 2009 in Canada um, there was uh, an additional brand introduced into the data set. If we look at a couple more examples for the EU and Australia, clearly the data sets do not have that variety of brands um, which could um, lead to uh, less robust averages. Um, but the Australian data set um, is in fact a mandatory um, registration scheme so um, there just aren't many brands on the Australian market um, and we did feel that we had um, representation from some of the largest brands in the EU but certainly not all uh, and indeed some of the data we gathered from EU um, suppliers was not able to be plotted due to lack of uh, specifics about the products. So a slightly mixed picture on the um, looking at the quality of the spread of brands uh, across the sets. If we look at the data quality overall, um, within this annex we have three quality levels that we assign to data which are robust, indicative and illustrative. 
we generally consider robust data to be that which is sales weighted from a reliable source that's well understood in terms of its derivation. Um, none of the data sets met the robust quality requirements basically because none were sales weighted. We only had lists of the products on the markets. Um, indicative quality is usually associated with um, data that um, we have a fairly good um, reliability of source for we generally feel that it's um, mostly it's, it's indicative of the performance of most of the market but perhaps not all in every case um, and indicative data sets generally don't have any major assumptions or any speculative content in terms of the analysis and the adjustments that are taken if we call a data set illustrative then um, we would consider it to be uh, known to be not representative of the whole market um, there may be significant assumptions about the uh, quality uh, about the analysis steps um, or indeed maybe the um, test methodologies used uh, to generate it are not clearly understood um, so the the all of the data in this analysis was given a grading of indicative. The uh, countries made available data sets of, of different types um, for this analysis. We did have um, two mandatory registers for Australia and Canada. We had data from individual manufacturers from the EU and we had federal um, endorsement scheme um, from the USA in terms of the Energy Star scheme. So this includes only the better performing products on the market. And the Californian data set comes from the state government. It's a, it is mandatory and California does have mandatory minimum requirements for uh, its products, uh, for its vending machines, which we will um, come back to uh, in a later slide. In terms of the test methodologies that are in use, there are basically two main uh, methodologies amongst the countries that we examined. Firstly, the ASHRAE test methodology, number 32.1, is the one used as the basis for um, the government um, schemes in Australia, Canada and the USA. And the EU has um, a test methodology that was developed by the Manufacturers Association for the EU, uh, the European Vending Association Test Protocol. The principles of these two approaches are very similar in principle. Um, the um, results are both in the same, met the same um, units, uh, kilowatt hours per day or per 24 hours, and um, both tests involve um, rating points either at indoor or outdoor rating conditions and there are some slight differences in the temperatures used the humidities used for those two conditions um, but they're, they're relatively small and indeed those uh, small differences uh, can be compensated for When we compare the results between different countries um, and between data sets that involve different test methodologies, we do have to often adjust the figures to make sure that they are truly comparable to as great an extent as we can. We call this normalization. And for the data sets that we received on vending machines, um, we normalized all of the data to be as if it was tested at the outdoor ambient conditions. The majority of the data we received um, did was quoted at outdoor conditions. When it was quoted at indoor conditions, we made a compensation calculation, which was based on a, a rule of thumb that's um, often used in refrigeration, uh, which is that two and a half percent change in the energy consumption for every degree centigrade change in the uh, measurement temperature. So that resulted in around a 40% adjustment being made uh, to the uh, energy results of products tested at the indoor conditions. We didn't feel there was any other normalization required uh, to render the data comparable 
the internal storage temperatures were generally um, at a, the, the same temperature um, for all of the participating countries. So next, um, just a, a quick summary of the policies in place um, for the uh, d various countries. Um, we looked at the policies in terms of minimum requirements and in terms of energy labels. And we have minimum requirements in Canada, the USA, uh, and also within the state of California. Um, Australia and the EU do not have any minimum efficiency requirements, although there is a study ongoing at the moment within the EU that may result in minimum requirements um, uh, within uh, a couple of years of 2013. The only um, widely used energy label for vending machines is the Energy Star label, which is used in the USA, uh, in Canada, and in Australia. And the there is an EU voluntary energy label, which is run by the European Trade Association, which has been adopted by a few suppliers, um, but is not widely recognised within the EU, uh, certainly not at the moment. Now, if we look at the types of product, um, on the market, uh, of course, uh, based on the types of products that are in our data sets. Um, one of the major um, features that influences energy consumption and energy efficiency is the uh, type of front that the machine has. If it's opaque, then it has um, better insulation on, the, on that front face glass will tend to have a higher heat gain. And if we look at the proportion of the market um, for which that information was available, at least, then we see that the Australian, US, uh, Australian and US markets are predominantly opaque fronted, whereas the EU market is predominantly glass fronted. Uh, this information was not available for the Canadian data set, unfortunately. Now, if we look at the size of the units measured in terms of their capacity, which is in number of cans that the machine can hold, we see that there um, is a fair difference in the averages uh, across the different countries and regions. The EU has the lowest cap average capacity at 450 cans, whereas Australia and the US are closer to 600 or over 600. So quite a contrast uh, in the uh, sizes of products that we see in these data sets. If we look at the capacity in a different way, uh, this graph this graph shows the average capacity broken down into large, medium, and small um, cans, um, uh, products, in terms of the number of cans that they hold. And here we've, uh, we've considered large machines to be those that can take over 700 cans. Medium is between 500 and 700, and the small machines are those that uh, carry less than 500 cans or bottles. Um, we can see that the Australian and US Energy Star data sets um, have less than 20% or less or around 20% uh, of them being small um, with a majority actually being medium sized. Um, we do see um, the Californian data set um, has a, a lot of smaller products. Um, and indeed, the proportion of small products is uh, reasonably comparable between USA, Canada, and EU. Um, but we certainly see very few large products in the Canadian and EU markets. So quite a contrast, really, across the sets in terms of the balance of sizes of machines. And also bear in mind when we look at the efficiency of these products that smaller machines would generally have lower efficiency due to a higher uh, surface area to volume ratio. 
The next slide shows the um, proportion of each data set for which the products were rated at the indoor condition or at the outdoor condition. The indoor condition uh, is around 24 degrees centigrade. The outdoor condition uh, is generally defined as a much higher ambient temperature which is typical of summer conditions um, in some of these countries and indeed is really a test of the machine's ability to deal with those hot conditions um, and uh, is, it does not really reflect the, condi or the conditions that will be experienced by a typical machine in the field for any significant proportion of the year. Generally the EU machines um, tend to be rated at their indoor condition um, and indeed the Canadian ones have a um, slight majority rated at indoor condition. Most other markets, um, the um, predominant condition uh, at which the machines are tested and the data is declared are for outdoor or for both um, conditions. All the data gathered uh, which was rated at indoor conditions was adjusted or normalized to, to appear in this analysis as if it was tested at the outdoor condition. Interestingly, the new Energy Star criteria that were released in March 2013 are based on only the indoor conditions, which are more typical of um, the conditions that a machine would experience over an average year. So returning to this uh, contrast between the EU market for vending machines and the Australian, Canadian and US one, basically the EU market tends to be dominated by the glass front uh, flexible vending machines for which the whole of the interior space will generally be cooled, um, often um, because it may contain perishable um, goods uh, within that space and so it, they would all have to be kept cool. The EU market has resulted in uh, a market for machines that tend to be smaller. Um, the, um, they are often uh, more often restocked than the larger um, machines you see elsewhere uh, in the world. And unfortunately, because of the smaller size and the glass front, the average machine in Europe is inherently less efficient than those elsewhere. And those in the Australian, Canadian and USA markets um, are um, predominantly opaque fronted with that insulation on the front. They tend to be larger and they tend to be overall better insulated. And another feature which is becoming um, quite significant in these dedicated vending machines uh, to reduce consumption is that they have zone cooling where it's only the few cans that are um, near to being sold that are reduced in temperature to the final serving temperature and the majority of the um, storage within the product within the machine is actually at a higher storage temperature uh, a few degrees higher um, which reduces the overall energy consumption of the unit so if we now look at some of the energy analysis results. Firstly, the average consumption in kilowatt hours per day for the various data sets. The Australian data set, which has the, uh, the, the red uh, square markers, this has generally um, the largest capacity, the largest average capacity, um, and perhaps not surprisingly, um, it has the largest consumption in kilowatt hours per day as well. In contrast, the Energy Star data set um, has, um, you can see in the data set, a significant drop in consumption between 2006 and 2007, which coincides with the introduction of the version 2 criteria for that scheme. And we do see the average consumption significantly lower than the other data sets. Interestingly, the EU machine's average consumption is not much different to that of Australia. Uh, it's about 4% lower, but the average 
EU machine is around 25% smaller than that in Australia in terms of its capacity. So quite clearly the efficiency of those units uh, is going to be different. This is a, a scatter plot of uh, the individual products from the various data sets in terms of the kilowatt hours per day, um, all of that being normalized to the outdoor conditions against the machine capacity uh, on the horizontal axis, which is number of cans and bottles. So one aspect to note, the Energy Star data, the orange um, dash type uh, symbols, that is nearly all in the lower consumption zone uh, of the area you can see. Um, we do have a pretty broad spread of capacities from um, most of the data sets. The, the, the one that doesn't have um, the um, quite as broad a spread is the EU where its maximum capacity is um, lower than that of the other sets. Um, but similarly the spread in terms of consumption is is, uh, is quite high, uh, particularly for the EU data set. Um, the EU data set has the highest consuming and the lowest consuming product um, in the uh, data set that you can see on the graph there. Now if we look at efficiency levels achieved, um, we have taken an efficiency level which is actually a specific consumption, so it's kilowatt hours per day per 300 cans capacity. And of course those machines that uh, were dedicated for uh, well, sorry, were flexible for food um, and other types of um, vendable product. Not all of those had capacities um, in, given in terms of number of cans, and so uh, those without that capacity information could not be plotted on this and the other graphs. Um, so not all of the data could be uh, included in these averages. But this graph shows how the um, all of the data sets except Energy Star um, have been constant in their energy efficiency um, over the period that we monitored. And as I pointed out before, the step in um, the step change in consumption for the Energy Star data set between 2006 and 2007 is attributable to the change in criteria there. The EU machines have the poorest average efficiency um, or its specific consumption of the whole of the all of the data sets and indeed when you look at the efficiency achieved by the EU the average EU machine compared to that average from the Energy Star data set Energy Star machines consume just over half the energy per 300 cans compared to the EU so a significant difference in average efficiency there Now if we look at the best consuming product in each of these data sets, uh, we see a lot narrower spread of performance. Um, the best EU machines are actually quite similar in performance to the best of the Canadian and Australian machines. Although we can see how the Californian and Energy Star machines are 30% better than uh, the best performing EU machine. Now this is the same scatter plot data as you saw previously, but superimposed are now the lines for the minimum requirements in each of these countries. And firstly, um, if we just look briefly at the Canadian minimum requirements, uh, the Canadian government sets two different requirements, one for uh, what they call multi-package glass fronted units, and a, a different one for the uh, dedicated beverage machines with opaque fronts and that's why we have two lines on this graph for Canada. The Energy Star uh, criteria um, and these are the version 2 criteria um, bearing in mind that uh, the version 3 criteria only took effect in March 2013. So the Energy Star version 2 um, actually has a single requirement for both indoor and outdoor 
rated machines. But for the purposes of this plot, we've actually normalized the indoor tested uh, rating conditions, um, which then separates them from the minimum requirement for outdoor type machines. The Californian beverage machine uh, requirements are shown as the purple solid line, which took effect from 2007. Uh, those are rated at outdoor temperature, so um, are as declared. And there is a separate Californian requirement for glass fronted and snack machines, which coincides with the Canadian uh, requirement for those products at the higher consumption level you can see on the graph. Now, given the range of performance here, there is certainly scope to tighten the requirements in all of these areas. Um, the uh, range of consumption uh, is significant uh, at uh, virtually all of the capacity points along this graph. And um, as I have previously pointed out, the Energy Star criteria were um, changed to version 3 in March of 2013 and those requirements are now in terms of internal volume um, instead of capacity uh, in terms of cans and so those requirements could not be plotted on this graph. So finally um, we have um, selected a few observations um, from the point of view of policymakers on the results that you've seen there. Um, the first is a reminder of the contrast in types of market. Um, the EU machines are typically 20% smaller on average than those in other markets and they are inherently less efficient due to mainly to the uh, presence of the glass front uh, which leads to higher heat gain but also the EU machines um, are um, predominantly uh, those with the whole of the interior space refrigerated rather than the zone cooled uh, approach which is starting to become um, widely used in the dedicated beverage machines. And this really does reflect a different type of uh, business model used in the market for the EU. Secondly, in, across all the data sets, we have seen no evidence of improvement over time uh, arising from these data sets. Um, despite the existence of minimum requirements, uh, the only change that we saw uh, was at the point of um, the change of the Energy Star criteria, where we did see a, a step change. But bear in mind that is a voluntary label and not all products um, will necessarily comply with it. So despite um, their uh, being no evidence of an improvement trend, they'd certainly uh, we do see evidence of a significant scope to improve efficiency. Uh, the range of efficiencies, the best to worst, is around 300% uh, in all of these markets that we've looked at. Um, and the best performing products um, are actually using between a third uh, and a half of the um, energy per can of um, poorer performing products. The final observation is really noting what has been recognized in the new Energy Star criteria which is that the outdoor rating condition is not really relevant for the conditions that uh, machines see in uh, most of the year. Um, is only really relevant to um, for testing if the machine can cope with peak temperatures. So there is more information on vending machines included in the main report which you can download from the website that you can see on this slide. Um, but you can also see from that website um, the benchmarking reports and indeed the mapping reports for individual countries uh, for the longer list of um, types of product and machine that you see on the list there. If if you have any questions regarding this presentation and the reports or any comments, uh, we would be very pleased to hear from you um, at the uh, email addresses that you can see on the screen there. We hope you found this valuable and uh, we hope you will look out for future reports 
produced by the Mapping and Benchmarking Annex of the IEA 4E Implementing Agreement. Thank you for your time.